God's people said, amen. amen. I really feel sorry for you folks today because I didn't preach last week. You know, my son <laughs> didn't ask me. Usually I go on vacation. He'll say, Dad, you're going to preach this morning? I'm like, I- I'm on vacation. <laughs> but he did. Terry sang, and I sat there and enjoyed it, you know. It's good. I have a little break once in a while. <laughs> but, but when you get back here to your own pulpit or church, your own church family, uh, I, I miss it, and I enjoy being here. This is where God called me here, and so I'm excited to be here this morning. Good to see our guests visiting with us from uh, Sacramento and Boise. How long are you staying in Hawaii for? You're going back this week? Yeah, yeah. We have a great family there, and uh, I, I, I felt bad I wasn't, wasn't here to be there for the service. You know, my son, his family went away. While we were there, he was alone. We were with my son alone. His wife and kids went to uh, South Carolina, Hilton Head, right? Uh, Nikki, my daughter-in-law's father, gets a place every year, rents a big house with like seven bedrooms right on the beach. He invited us to go. I said, look, I'm coming to New Jersey to be with my mother and my family. It's very tempting. He would pay for everything, wouldn't have to pay a penny and stay on the beach. I said, nah. Staying here in God's country, New Jersey, and uh, with my family. But his, he was alone, so we got to spend some good time uh, with him. But he's, uh, you know, young church. He's involved in the town as a, uh, like a councilman. He ran for office, and he won the election. So, man, when we're with Dominic, uh, he's got these ear pods. You ever see the things now? They don't, you know, when we go on the plane, they, they offer you these things to watch movies to put in your ears, but he has these wireless, so you don't even know he has anything on. And a lot of times he's talking, I'm thinking he's talking to me, and he's on the phone talking with somebody all the time. Me, personally, when you talk to somebody, you look at them in the eye, you want to talk about something with Dominic, he's so busy all the time that he really doesn't have time to even just sit around and, you know, chat. Have what they say, talk story here, right? Forget it. You can talk for about five seconds if you can get it in there and hope when he responds that he's talking to you and not the guy on his earbuds. But anyway, we had a good time, uh, Terry and I. We enjoyed ourselves. We had some good uh, New Jersey uh, Italian food <laughs> on Sunday. My mother, we had uh, 16 people at a restaurant after church we went to where I used to pastor called Sorrentina. They're from Sorrento, Italy. I know John and Lana came back from their trip to Europe. I don't know if you went to Sorrento. It's near the Amalfi Coast, like north of Naples on the east coast, or on the west coast of Italy. Good food, and uh, my mother had three birthday parties. We sang happy birthday three times. <laughs> we hadn't done it here yet in Hawaii, so maybe uh, this week, Mom, will have a little party for you at uh, California Pizza Kitchen or something like that. But it was good. The weather was cold. Not cold, cool. 60s. If it's 60 here, it's cold. Right up there, it's like springtime. But uh, we had a good time seeing all the different things. But I do miss being here. And you're in our thoughts and prayers. That, that's so weird. I think we were on Wednesday night. I think it was on Zoom, right, Brother Hal? So we're in bed. <laughs> we're we took a look. I said, is that live? Yeah. That says now. This is, you know, 7 o'clock in Hawaii. It's 1 o'clock in the morning where we were. So that, that's uh, getting used to that. It's tough. Anyway, we're looking today, and we started, this is the third lesson only, so if you're here, you didn't miss too much, but First Peter, and of course, uh, we, as you looked in the verse, he was talking in first verse 1 of chapter 1 to the strangers, remember we did that lesson already, scattered throughout the five areas there in the Roman Empire. These were people that were being persecuted for their faith, and a lot of times we think, has it never happened? in 2022, what Christians went through, martyred, persecuted, losing their work, their jobs, their families, disowning them because of their faith. It can't happen. No, it can. And it will. While we were there, one of the men that I know personally, another pastor that ran for governor of New Jersey, and I wish he had won, Governor Murphy is a terrible governor in New Jersey. I hope you're listening, Governor Murphy. <laughs> Not really. I get in trouble a lot of times with the microphone, you know. But he ran, and because the Republican Party was so split up and divided, he didn't get through the primaries. Someone else won, and now the election's coming up, as you know, here as well, November 8th. We'll have a new governor here, and I hope you're going to vote. 
and vote your conscience, vote according to biblical principles. I always say that, never tell you who to vote for. That's up to you, of course. But um, they, they went, and to Phil Rizzo is his name. He pastors a church in Hoboken, you know, where Frank Sinatra came from. And so he gave up his job. Uh, he, he left the ministry. Someone else took the church, which I don't necessarily agree with, but he ran because he felt like we need good people in, in government. We talked about it a little while ago, John, right? And he's a soul winner. He's a, a good guy. So now he's running for something else. But they went into his bank account. He has TD Bank. All right? I, I had Bank of America when I was in New Jersey. I have a Bank of Hawaii now. They went and took and, and closed all his bank accounts because of uh, misinformation. You hear about that word now? <laughs> you know what that means? It not, doesn't really mean what you're saying is wrong. It means you don't agree with the current administration. And so it's misinformation. And they went in and said, we got to close all your accounts. Uh, you know Candace Owens? She's a young uh, black conservative. They did that to her. And they started a whole new group. I forget what the name of it is, but they have for conservative people because you have to have a bank to do business. You know, we looked at uh, years ago what would happen in, in Revelation, what will happen in the future. It says that you won't be able to buy and sell, you know, if, if you don't have the mark of the beast. And, and things are happening today that this prophecy, these prophecies, plural, are, are coming to pass in ways that we never would imagine. So don't be surprised. Uh, if things uh, happen to you, I don't know if you were ever on Facebook or any of these things, Instagram, and, and you write something down and it all of a sudden says it wouldn't go through because it was misinformation. It's happened to me several times. There is not really a, a freedom of speech as we once knew it because of these things. Well, thank the Lord we can still preach the Bible. Amen. We have God's word. We have the truth of God's word. We're doing that lesson with the young men this morning in Sunday school about the Bible, about the word of God and the importance of it. There may come a time where they tell you, you've got to shut the doors of the church, we're locking you down because this is hate speech. You can't preach the Bible anymore. Well, then we're going to see what, what happens. But I, I think we're almost to a point where people are going to have to take a stand. They don't have to be nasty about it. But we have to take a stand at some point for what we believe and for preaching the gospel. If they said to me, I cannot share the gospel with people anymore, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to share the gospel because God's commands are stronger than men's, all right? Now they told us to shut down uh, during COVID. Guess what? We shut down. We went online after a few weeks. I think uh, we stopped March of 2020. COVID started and shutdowns. May of 2020, which was really not that bad. Two months later, we opened. You'll see there's still blue tape on the floor where we had the social distancing mask. We had the thermometer when everybody came in. We followed the rules as best we could. But what if they said, you can't even preach now? You cannot get up and open this book and preach because this is a book, it's a filled with hate. Well, they're saying it. <laughs> you know it. What am I going to do? Well, that's when we're going to separate the men from the boys and we're going we're to preach because God's word is vital. It, it's so important. And these believers, Peter's writing, again, to the scattered strangers, he calls them, because they're in foreign places all over the world. They had to leave. They had to flee for their lives, a lot of them. And he's trying to comfort them. And this message is how to be secure through suffering, all right? Number one, know that you're Christian, you're saved, you're going to, going to heaven, this world is not our home. And also, this lesson today is know your living hope. You have a lively hope, it says here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 5. You can, you can actually take these verses here, 3, 4, and 5, and, and preach the gospel from these three verses. Look at it again. Let's read it again. We're going to be going through it. We won't be here really long this morning, but I want to thoroughly go through these verses because this is your, your eternal life depends upon this, your eternal life. Look at verse 3. Blessed, he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? God the Father, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again. That begotten us means born again, right? You know, in the Old Testament, so-and-so begot so-and-so. We, we were begotten, we were born of the Spirit because of God the Father and His mercy unto a lively hope, a living hope. We're going to get into that in a moment. How? By the resurrection. This is the most important part of the gospel. The death, the burial, but it didn't stay buried, it didn't stay dead, amen? His resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Here's what we have now. To an inheritance is what we have. Incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept 
by the power of God. We're not kept through our own efforts. We're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And those three verses, they're very powerful and rich with doctrine. It's one of those passages in the Bible that it would take, it really would. Time it would not allow us this morning in the 40 minutes or whatever we study to go through each thing. We will, but barely skim the surface. But the most wonderful thing about this scripture here today is it has to do with our glorious hope. We sang the hymn. We picked that hymn specifically for this lesson. My hope is in the Lord, right? My hope is in the government. No, my hope is in myself. No, my hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me. What's the great hope of believers here? If you're this morning, if you're here, you've trusted Christ as your Savior. It's the hope of eternal life, living forever in heaven with God, with Christ, with other believers, eternally, forever and ever, without end, all right? Eternally. Our minds are not eternal. We can't even grasp what that means. Never ending. We'll never die. We'll be with God eternally. Yes, it's a promise, and it's our hope. There's no greater privilege given to mankind, all right, than that living or lively hope. Number one here, I didn't get to point one yet. This is the point one on the introduction. The living hope means it's not a dead hope. It's not a lifeless hope. It's not the kind of a hope that makes people think for a moment something good and then doesn't do anything for us beyond this life in the grave, beyond the grave. Second, a living hope means it's not a probable hope. Hope. It's not, in other words, a hope so. I hope so I'm going to heaven. It's not a hope so kind of a hope. It's not the kind of hope that uh, may or may not happen. <laughs> the hope God gives us is a living hope. A lively hope, it says here. It's a hope that's real, it's true, and it actually exists. We didn't sing the hymn today, but the hymn goes, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, right? I dare not trust my frame, this physical body, this life, this world, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Amen? You're trusting Christ. You're in a good place. A living hope means it's active. It's active. It works in the heart. In our hearts, we trust Christ by faith, the heart decision by faith. And it's also a reality, all right? It's a living hope that we're going to be in heaven forever with Christ. It really exists, this eternal life, and, of course, the spiritual world, the spiritual realm, more than this world <laughs> we say we live in. It's not our home. We're just passing through. The believer's hope for eternal life lives, it acts, it works, even while we're alive on this earth. Thank God for that hope. It's not that the believer is going to receive someday. A lot of people think, I trust Christ now. I'm going to go through my life and die one day, physical death. And then I will have eternal life. No, it's a present possession. It's a living hope. It's a lively hope. We've already received, if you trusted Christ, the gift. You have the gift. It's already wrapped up, has your name on it. It's in the Lamb's Book of Life, your name. You have it. John 3.36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath, that word the old King James is has, or have, present tense. You have everlasting life. When? The moment you trusted Christ. Not to say, I'm looking ahead to that time, yeah, to go to heaven. But you have the gift. You have the past. You have a reserved spot for you in heaven. Now, the moment you trusted Christ. He that believeth not the Son, however, shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Uh, that word there with the E-T-H at the end, abideth, means God's wrath abides forever on that person's soul unless they trust Christ. Then God's wrath is taken out and you have the free gift of eternal life. I have three points today, three points. Number one, the source of this lively hope. The source of this lively hope. Look at verse three again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The source of our hope, God the Father. <laughs> the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Father, again, Christ mentioned here. He's Lord. He's Jesus of Nazareth, the God-man. He was human, but he was the God-man. God became man, all right? The Word became flesh in John and dwelt among us. Then he's also the Christ, 
That word Christos there in the original language is Messiah. The promised seed, all right, all the way back was Abraham was promised that through his seed, the Messiah would come. That's Jesus, the Christ, to save us from the penalty of our sin, which is death and hell, separation from God eternally. And here's a wonderful thing. If you've trusted Christ, then God, the Father of Jesus, becomes our Father. Amen? He becomes our Heavenly Father. He's the God that gives eternal life. And again, God's not, again, out of space somewhere. I know, you know, God's a spirit. We worship him in spirit and truth. I understand that. We don't see him as a physical being. But God is a spirit, but we have that living, lively hope by trusting Christ. He becomes our spiritual heavenly father. I know when we pray, we say, Heavenly Father, God, our Father. Our, the prayer, our Father, all right, that Jesus gave, a model prayer, not to be repeated, but to be used as a model. We pray to him. He's our heavenly Father. How? Because of what he did through the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we do when we trust him as our Savior, we become, as John chapter 1 says, born again. Jesus told Nicodemus, right? Very religious Jew. Jesus said, don't marvel not, don't be shocked that I'm telling you, Nicodemus, you must be, not maybe, you must be born again. And he didn't even know what he was talking about, Nicodemus. He had the, the look on his face of maybe uh, uh, of shock. Born again, what are you talking about? I have to go back a second time into my mother's womb? No, that which is flesh is flesh, that which is spirit is spirit. We have a physical birth, but we need, we must have, if we're going to have hope, we must have the gift of eternal life through, again, faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Most religions are based on what God did and what you have to do, right? It's a, sometimes a combination of both. No, it's not. It's all God and the free gift of salvation by faith through his grace. Eternal life exists nowhere else. Only God, the Father of Christ, can give us, he's the source of this eternal life. If we want it, and we should want it, only God, the Father of Christ, can give us that living, lively hope of eternal life. It, there's no other way to have that hope. People have a lot of hope in other things, but it's not an everlasting hope. How does God go about giving us this living hope? <laughs> You know how it comes to us? Through his abundant mercy. You could say his grace. It's the basis of our hope. It's not by works. If it was by works, we'd never do enough good works. We'd be comparing everybody to each other, saying, I did more than you, and you've got to do this, this, and that in order to get to heaven. No, it's been paid for. All we have to do is apply our faith. In other words, it's the object of our faith. It's not our faith. It's what we're trusting. We're trusting Christ and what he did on the cross. This is the basis of hope. Man is so sinful, we have only one way, we have one hope, one source of eternal life. No other way, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to what? The Father but by me. And so it's not the Baptist way, it's not the Catholic way, it's not definitely not the Jehovah's Witness way, it's not the Mormon way, it's the Jesus way, amen? It's the Jesus way. Just think what we've done, again, to God. The Bible says before we were saved, we were at enmity. You might not feel that way. I didn't feel that way until someone showed me what the Bible had to say about that. I thought I was a pretty good person, you know. Good works, religion. And then the lady showed me the Bible, and the Bible smacked me right in the face with the truth of it, saying, no, you're a sinner. No matter good things you do. In fact, not only do you not do good things, but you've ignored God, you've neglected God, you've rebelled against God, you've cursed God, you've disobeyed God, you've sinned, and you turned from Him. And the list, again, can go on and on. But the only hope is the grace and mercy of a perfect, sinless God. You can say, how can God save me? You ever have anybody say that to you? I've done, you don't know what I've done. God would never save me. No, no, God especially wants to save you and show you where sin abounds, Grace did much more abound. In other words, there's never sin too great that God can't forgive. The word mercy here, it means feelings. This is what God has for us. This is how much he cared for us. Even while we were yet sinners, Romans 5, 8 says. He felt pity on us, compassion, affection, 
Kindness, the word means a desire to succor. That word S-U-C-C-O-R is like a mom taking a newborn baby to herself and taking care of it, to tenderly draw one person to oneself and to care for that person. That's what mercy means. Aren't you glad God's a merciful God? Two things essential in order to get mercy is God saw what we needed and met the need. All right, mercy is God withholding his justice. God's a holy God. <laughs> We're not. God could just wipe out the human race if he wanted every right to do it, and he'd be right to do that. We're not getting what we deserve. That's God's mercy. Not getting what we deserve. It's like your parents tell you you've got to do something. If you don't do it, you're getting a spanking, and then all of a sudden they say, I'm in a good mood today. I'm not going to spank you. That's mercy. You deserve the spanking, but you're not going to get it. Isn't that nice? <laughs> I always say, well, that's, that's two wrongs now. The kid did wrong, and now the parents didn't discipline him, and you're raising a corrupt little child there. Give it to him, and give it to him good. That's love. <laughs> Mercy is not getting, I deserve, and we all deserve, let's face it, folks, we're sinners by birth, by choice. God says, I love the world so much, I'm going to send my only begotten son. Whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have ever led. That's God's desire. God's not willing that any should perish. Could you imagine? People that have ignored, neglected, hated, rejected, cursed, blasphemed against the holy God. God says, I still love you. I'm going to come to this earth. I'm going to die and take your place. We, we can't understand that because that's what they call agape love. That's the strongest form of love. It's unconditional. Even though we were all these bad things, God says, I love you unconditionally. I love you in spite of all the negative. In fact, we might say, well, I wasn't that bad. <laughs> I told that woman that led me to Christ, come on, I'm not that bad. And she says, no, you're bad. <laughs> this is a holy, perfect, sinless, sovereign God, and you're going to compare yourself to him? We all, then she used that verse in Romans, you know, we fall short of his glory. We do, no matter who it is. The Bible says even our good things that we try to claim to be you know, we're going to heaven because of this, this, this. God says, you know those good things, those things you think are righteous? They are like filthy rags in God. When, when you're trying to use those for salvation, God says, get it out of here. It's like rotten garbage. I can't take the stench. Take it out of this place. You're not going to go to heaven on any good works because to God, he says, it's, it stinks. God withholding his judgment. Mercy is also God providing a way for us to be saved, getting something we don't deserve. What's that? Eternal life. Can you imagine? Aren't you glad you're saved this morning if you are? He says this too about this mercy. He has abundant, <laughs> abundant mercy. It means great mercy, overflowing mercy, endless, no boundaries, boundless mercy. His mercy just goes on and on. It's better than the, uh, <laughs> what's the bunny with the battery? Right. It's covering us. It's creating a lively hope. And again, the presence of the gift now in our hearts of eternal life once we've trusted Christ. Romans 11.32 says, God hath concluded them all in unbelief, just like all have sinned, that he might have mercy upon all. It wasn't just, well, we know this terrible people that have lived in human history. And we could name names, right? No, all of us. We're, we're in that list. It's not, well, these are really bad over here, and this people here are like normal people, and these people, they're not too bad, really good people. We're all under the same list, though. Sinner. <laughs> same. We, we like to have degrees, and John says, no. All unbelief, so I can have mercy on all of you. Yes, all. Uh, Ephesians 2, 4, and 5 says, but God who is rich in mercy, he's rich in it, abundant mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead, that's spiritually dead, dead in sins, hath quickened us, made us alive, that means, together with Christ, for by grace are you saved. God's mercy, God's grace, we don't understand it. Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. You got God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and Jesus, God's Son, all at work in salvation. Lamentations 3.22 says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed, because his compassions fail not. His mercy 
Aren't you glad God felt that way? You know, we look at the Old Testament sometimes when God wanted to wipe out Israel because of their sin and unbelief. And Moses, on behalf of the people, remember, would go and pray, please, don't destroy these people out here. We're in the wilderness. What would the Egyptians think? And what would the people in the land, you know, the Canaanites and all the different groups look at us that we got out of Egypt so we can die out here in the desert? And it said God repented of Again, not sin, but God changed his mind about destroying the nation of Israel. And I'm glad that he changed his mind about destroying me. We could have very easily lived a life, thought we were fine, you know, we have our religion, we do good deeds and try to live as best as we can. I used to have the thing, someone told me that there's like a scale in heaven, you know, good and bad. If you have more good than bad, you might just, you know, sneak in. And what kind of hope is that? That's not hope at all. <laughs> it's not God's hope. This living hope, all right, comes about by a new birth. You know, the words there in verse 3, begotten according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again. Being spiritually born, begotten again. There's no hope, no hope for eternal life unless a person is born again by the Spirit of God. We must be. We must, not just a nice song to sing, Ye must be born again, ye must be born again. I verily, verily say unto thee, Jesus to Nicodemus, you must be born again, and you, to have this living hope, there's no, again, no hope of it without eternal life and without Christ being born again. Jesus said to him, Nicodemus, in John 3, 3, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see Forget about going to heaven, you're not even going to see it, right? John 3, 5 through 7, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, talking to Nicodemus still, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And then he says, Marvel not. He must have had a look on his face. That's what I always say. Don't be shocked that I say unto thee, Nicodemus, very religious, Pharisee, you must be born again. Being born again, 1 Peter 1, 23, of corruptible, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. That was one of the verses in the subject of the word of God this morning in our class. And so it's a born again, you must be. A lot of people think that term born again, that came out from the 60s and 70s. No, it came out thousands of years ago, God's word. It's not a new term. Maybe a new term to some people, but Jesus said, you must be. Another point here is the, this living hope, this lively hope, comes about by the resurrection of Christ from the dead. <laughs> All right? By his resurrection. And we always uh, say the gospel is three points. His death, according to the scriptures, right? He's buried, rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. But the most important part of those three is, of course, his resurrection. He did not stay dead. He had victory over death, hell, and the grave, so that when we trust him, we know that we have this living and this lively hope because of the resurrection of Christ. Number one, it proved God has the power. He's an omnipotent, sovereign God to raise the dead, no doubt. Second, because he raised Christ from the dead, all right, he is who he said he was, the Savior of the world, the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Romans 4.25 said, talking about Christ, who was delivered for our offenses and raised up again for our justification. Has a lot to do, the resurrection, all to do really with our salvation. Romans 10, 9 and 10. This is a verse we use to seal uh, the deal, you can say, when we're leading someone to Christ. You have to pray and by faith receive Christ. And you say, where do you get that? Romans 10, 9 and 10. For thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall hear it as faith. Believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. That's the gospel in, in the gospel, the resurrection in the gospel, I'm sorry, all right? God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Future perfect tense. So here's the condition for salvation. Confess with your mouth, we say, pray the sinner's prayer. And believe in your heart by faith that Christ rose from the dead. The gospel, thou shalt be saved if you do those simple things. For with the heart, a man believeth unto righteousness, there's faith. And with the mouth, confession is made. I'm trusting Christ. I'm a sinner and I deserve to go to hell, but I don't want to go to hell. And I'm trusting Christ today as my personal Lord and Savior. The gospel, 
To have this living hope, we must be born again. Second point here, we talked about the source of the hope, God, the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's the inheritance. This is a good part here. The inheritance. Look at verse 4. You're saved. All right, look at verse 3 again. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a living, lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To what? There's a comma there at the end, right, of verse 3, because it's a continuing sentence. To an inheritance. We have an inheritance. Did you ever inherit anything? When my father-in-law died, uh, my mother-in-law went through this website that said, there's money out there that you may have forgotten about, insurance policy, maybe nobody knew about, whatever. And so I said, come on. We went on the thing, and she found out there was like $5,000 that she got. She inherited. It belonged to her that someone else gave to her by inheritance. We have, through faith in Christ, being born again by his abundant mercy because of the resurrection of Christ, we have an, an incorruptible. <laughs> you may have inherited. Remember Jackie Gleason? Uh, somebody said, we have a meeting. We have to go. One of your customers died, and they're leaving you their fortune. And he's like, hamana, 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 hamana. And so Jackie Gleason went and told his boss off at the uh, bus station because he didn't like the guy. I'm going to get a fortune. I don't care. I'm quitting my job. I told off uh, Mr. Some, so-and-so at the station, and, and Alice is saying, Maybe he shouldn't have done that. You know, Alice was always right. It's like, nah, I'm sick of him. I told him off. I'm going to have a fortune. I'm going to be taken care of the rest of my life. Anything, Alice, we're going to have the best house. We're going to get out of this dump. So they went to the, uh, the reading of the will. And he's all dressed up with his suit and his hat and everything. And he's a ah, Ralph job. What's his name? <laughs> Norton was with him. He said, Ralph, well, this is great. And the guy says, and now we come to the part of Mr. Cramden, my faithful bus driver, I leave you my fortune. And, and he goes, all right, all right, give it to me. And they had this thing with a cover over it, and he takes the cover off. It's a bird. The name of the bird was Fortune. And here is my fortune. <laughs> and Jackie Gleason passes out whoa, on the ground. And so he, his hope was in a false hope. He thought he had, he had a fortune, but it was a bird, and <laughs> not what he thought it was. And listen, we have an inheritance as well, but this is a real inheritance. Verse 4, an inheritance incorruptible. There's four things about this. Undefiled, faded not away, and it's reserved. I love that. Reserved in heaven for you. We tried to get a reservation for my mom's birthday called Sorrentina from Hawaii a few weeks before. We have 20 people coming on Sunday, 2 o'clock after church. You don't have to give me the call, he said. He talked with the accent. He was Italian. You just to come in, and we have a plenty of seat here. I said, yeah, we have 20 people, and these, these Italians, they like to eat. If we don't have a seat, they're going to be mad. we got to get in, sit down, start eating, like within five minutes. We've got to have bread, oil, something, or else they're going to be upset. No, no, don't want you worry about it. we got got plenty of seats here. I said, can't we make a reservation? No, we don't take a reservation. I said, what kind of restaurant you got there? I shouldn't have said that. He might poison my food or something, but anyway, we got there, the seats were all set up. It's nice to have, if you can have it. Terry and I, for Valentine's Day, said we're going to go out and have a nice dinner at this place in Honolulu. I think it was, I don't know if it's Honolulu, Buca di Beppo. You ever hear of it? It's not real Italian. If you like that place, have me to your house, I'll cook you a nice Italian meal, and you'll never go back there again. <laughs> but my cousin told me it was good, so Valentine's Day, they said, we're going to get your special chef seat. You'll be in the kitchen. You watch them cook, and I'm like, oh, this is great. I like that. And we get there, and there was a line outside the door. I'm like, man, it's Valentine's Day, right? And we said, we have a reservation. <laughs> we thought it was going to take us right in and walk right in past these people that are looking at us like, who do you think you are? I, I made a reservation. Come on. We didn't get in. The kitchen's so busy, we felt like it'd be da dangerous for you to go in there because of food being thrown around. I said, what? I'm, I'm not scared. I'll go in there. I'll help them cook. No, no, you can't go in there. I was so upset. We had to sit outside for an hour. We got in. We didn't like the food. They didn't have espresso afterward. The machines broke. I said, this big multi-million dollar place, you don't even have a coffee machine. <laughs> so this reservation now, however, this is a good one. Amen. <laughs> we have an inheritance, a gift of eternal life that is inherited, we've given to us by our 
beyond rich heavenly father. Albert Barnes, I, I read a lot, a commentator said, said this about the inheritance. Through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, we now cherish the hope of that future inheritance in heaven. Christians are regarded as the adopted children of God, and heaven is spoken of as their inheritance, inheritance. And what their father will give and bestow on them is the proof of his love. We have an inheritance. Amen. Say, this earth, I'm sick of it. Can't watch the news. Everything I watch, it's hopeless. So I might be hopeless here. But it's not up there. Amen. We have an inheritance. Not only that, we have an inheritance. He says it's incorruptible. You know what that means? It means it'll never perish. It doesn't have an expiration. <laughs> we got home uh, yesterday, and I said, my mom usually has toast in the morning. So Terry said, I'm Amy, I made you a little coffee, and I went to get the toast and the bread. It was in the refrigerator. Green molded. <laughs> I said it was only there a week. I had to throw it in the garbage. I had an expiration. Sometimes we have stuff in the fridge, you know, the stuff that's sort of in the back that you don't see every day, and you're looking for some kind of hot sauce or something, and you pull out the bottle, it's like, oh, whoo, it's got some kind of a, a fur on the top. <laughs> I, no way I'm using that. Garbage, yeah, what's the expiration? 2013? <laughs> Wait a minute, how long was that in there? Incorruptible means no expiration date on this living hope. It cannot perish. It does not age like we do. It does not deteriorate. It will never die. It doesn't have the seed of corruption. It doesn't come through this earth. This is incorruptible. Incorruptible. Matthew Henry, another commentator, said, everything on earth changes from better to worse over time, but not our inheritance. Amen. It's perfect. Incorruptible. It'll never change. It'll never cease to be a perfect gift from a loving Heavenly Father. That's not all. It's undefiled. That means it cannot be polluted like sometimes water under the ground can be polluted. I'm sick of watching that Camp Lejeune commercial about the lawyers that are trying to make millions of dollars from the poor Marines that drank the water there. Undefiled means it can never be polluted, never be dirtied, never be infected. It means our inheritance is without flaw, without defect. It will be perfectly free from sickness, disease, infection, accident, pollution, any defilement whatsoever. Incorruptible, undefiled, not only that, it will not ever fade away. <laughs> that means it'll last forever. The splendor and beauty of it all shall never diminish. You know how you get a new car? I love to get a new car. I like the new car smell. <laughs> they used to have a can in the store you can buy. You can spray your old car. And you go in there and it's like, new car, but there's a rip in the thing and the thing doesn't work and the button fell off. <laughs> this is truly <laughs> will not fade our inheritance. It'll never diminish. We're never going to get to heaven and say, well, I wish something different happened up here. I'm getting sick of praising the Lord all the time. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. It'll never fade away. And then it says, reserved in heaven for us, us that have trusted Christ. It's being held there, a spot. Not like, again, not like Buca di Beppo reservation. <clears throat> you may make reservation. I have a doctor. My mom's got a lot of doctor's appointments. Uh, we have a spot, sort of like an appointment. Well, this appointment here, is being held by God himself. God's waiting for us to finish our life on earth and what he has for us to do. And when we get there, we will be given our eternal inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled. It will never fade away. Acts chapter 20, verse 32 says, And now, brethren, I love this chapter when Paul's meeting with the elders of the church. He commends them. He's going to say goodbye. Remember, they hug him and they fall on his neck. I always want to see what kind of a hug is that when you fall on somebody's neck? I'm glad I'm a chiropractor. <laughs> Somebody's neck, at least you maybe fixed them. But now, brethren, he says, I commend you to God. Paul told these, I'm commending you. I'm sort of turning you over. I've trained you and I've taught you, and now I'm commending you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. You could say saved. Acts 26, 18 says, To open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may see, receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. 
Colossians 3.24 says, Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad we have an inheritance in heaven? Amen. Last point, the assurance of this hope. The assurance, that's verse 5, last point today. Kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. The question many people have is, how do we know that we will receive this incorruptible, undefiled, never fade away, reserved in, her, in heaven for you inheritance? The trials of life are so forceful at times and so threatening, and the temptations, how do we know we will receive this lively, lively or living hope of eternal life and this glorious inheritance? How do you know we will not fall and come short of the great day of redemption. <laughs> Two things here will be done. First, there's the assurance of God's power, who's keeping us, not us. Not, we're not kept by our own power. God's power keeps us. Okay, God's power keeps us. So look at verse 5, who are kept by the power of God, his omnipotence. All right, God's omnipotence is mighty. The word kept means to guard, it's a military term, to garrison, to protect, it's got the idea of force, might, and strength. This is the strength of our almighty, all-powerful God. All right? And through all the trials and temp temptations of life, God will see to it that we reach the glorious end of this life to spend eternity in heaven with him. Amen? It's an inheritance. and He is the one that's the keeper of it. His sovereignty, his omnipotent power, he'll see to it we receive that gift because of the faith we put in Christ. 2 Timothy 1.12 says, For the cause, Paul said, I also suffer thee th these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded he is able to keep, yeah, that which I've committed unto him against that day. He is able. Jude verse 24 says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. We're going to stand. We don't deserve it. I know that. We're going to stand sanctified, justified before a holy God, and knowing that it wasn't because of anything good that we can do to get this. It was because of all God's grace and mercy, right? This inheritance. And then second and last point, there's the assurance of God's power. There's the assurance of faith. Faith. Verse 5 says, kept by the power of God through faith. I love that. Faith we always say, is the key that opens up the door to salvation. For by grace you are saved through faith, kept by the power of God through faith. <laughs> Not your, so much you, but the object of your faith. We're kept by God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. No person will receive the hope of eternal life and this glorious inheritance unless he by faith trusts Christ as a Savior. <laughs> There's no, no other way. There's no... Well, let's get point B, uh, plan B. I tried plan A, and it's not working for me. Well, that's the only plan we have. <laughs> Once we've trusted Christ, we receive the gift, present tense, of eternal life and the great inheritance of God's promise. John 3.15, Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 5.24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath present tense again, everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said unto her, remember Lazarus' friend died, and Mary and Martha? He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Aren't you glad that it's not dependent upon us? <laughs> we're not kept by our own power. We're kept by the power of God through faith ready to be revealed at the last time. Your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and we do not have to face what the Bible calls the second death. First death is a physical death, right? Separation of body from soul. You bury the body or cremate the body, and your soul is eternal, made in God's image and likeness. But where are you going to go? There's no purgatory here, folks. You go to heaven because you trusted Christ. You have the gift of eternal life, or you have eternal death. That's eternal separation. That's another death. Separation from God forever in a place that wasn't meant for us. A place called hell. 
How to be secure through suffering. This is what Peter is writing to these strangers scattered throughout the Roman Empire. He says, know about your living hope. It's a lively hope. The source is God. The inheritance by God's mercy is incorruptible, undefiled, faded not away, reserved for you in heaven and in the assurance. How can you be sure? Well, you're kept by God. <laughs> if somebody told me God guarantees it, what other guarantee would you need? <laughs> you have God's word that this is an eternal life, this inheritance that you have that you're going to receive. Again, you have, you have eternal life now, present possession. But when we get to heaven, we will realize it in truth and we'll be there with him forever and ever. Eternal life. Today, if you're here and you've never trusted Christ, you say, I'm a very religious person. I'm really I'm a very good person. I'm a good citizen, I'm a good husband, I'm a good wife. I even go to a church regularly. I'm faithful in attendance. I give. I do what I can to help the poor. We give to missions. That, those are all good things. But if you've never prayed and received Christ as your personal Savior, He died for you, and you're not trusting Him. You may be trusting all these other things, and they're good things. But if you're not trusting Christ, the Bible says you're not born again. You have a body and a soul, but you're spiritually dead. In Ephesians, he's talking to people that have trusted Christ. He said, in times past, according to your sins in the past, you were dead in sins and trespasses. And now he says you've been quickened, made alive. By what? Spiritually alive by your faith in Christ. You must, Jesus said to Nicodemus, must be born again. You must be. There's no other way to go to heaven. So that's what Bethel Bible Church, that's what Pastor Cuso says, that's what you say to me. How do I know it's true? Well, we're taking God at his word. It's not Bethel Bible, because Bethel Bible believes, just happens to believe what God's word says on that. Amen? And there are a lot of churches that believe that as well. And there are a lot of churches that don't uh, believe that. And they, why Paul said to the Galatians, they were fools. Oh, foolish Galatians! They were adding works to salvation. No matter what you add to salvation, then it's not salvation by faith through grace anymore. And so we've trusted Christ. If you haven't, Brother John's going to come. We're going to sing a closing hymn. Think about if you died right now, where would you go? Would you go to heaven because you've trusted Christ? Or maybe you, you're not sure about that. You could see any one of us after the service. We'd love to take the Word of God and show you how you can trust Christ as your Savior. It's an important thing. You have an inheritance if you did that. If you didn't do that, you don't have that inheritance. You don't have that gift of eternal life reserved in heaven for you, and that's something that you would want to have. I don't know anybody in their right mind who says, I'm looking forward to going to hell. I don't want to go to heaven. I, again, in their right mind, <laughs> would never say that. If you're here today, see someone after the service. Don't leave here without trusting Christ. Let's pray. Father, bless this time now as we sing a hymn. Lord, as we think about what we've heard from you and through your word and by your spirit, speak to the hearts of those. Maybe uh, someone here never trusted Christ. They're not sure about it, that they would Make sure of it today. And then as believers, that we would rejoice in the facts that we learned from these three verses about our eternal destiny and our inheritance in heaven that's incorruptible, undefiled, faded not, not away, Lord, reserved in heaven for those who've trusted you. Bless this time, Lord. Speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.